Self-supervised pre-training is commonly thought of as the first step in representation learning. We get an enormous unlabeled data set from scraping the internet and train transformer models to generate that data. They learn to generate data by either reconstructing sequences that have masked out intermediate tokens or by using the context of the sequence to predict the most likely token that would come next. Then we would fine tune these models on our text classification task or some downstream task like that. This paper from researchers at Alexa AI shows that we can get more out of these pre-trained generative models than just as a stepping stone for representation learning. The authors use the generative pre-trained models to augment labeled data sets, conditioning the models on the class label so that the generated data doesn't corrupt the original label. These models show huge gains over not using any data augmentation or simple augmentations like synonym replacement. Further, the authors explore which generative model is the best for this out of BERT, GPT-2, and BART. This video will explain data augmentation using pre-trained transformer models. This video will explain data augmentation using pre-trained transformer models from researchers at Alexa AI. One of the primary motivations behind data augmentation or artificially augmenting our data such that we have a larger data set is that it's really hard to build these large labeled data sets. So frequently when we're trying to do some task, for example, I've been working on a tweet classifier and labeling all these tweets myself has been really difficult and doing it at the scale of tens of thousands of tweets would be really impossible. So we want some strategies that can help us uh, leverage these limited labeled data sets to still make use of deep learning and these text classifiers that can do things like uh, sentiment classification or question topic classification or things like classifying news articles or the example of tweets or something like intent classification for a chatbot. So we want to be able to leverage these massive pre-trained uh, generative language models for our text classification task with a limited labeled data set. And we might be able to do more with these pre-trained generative models than just fine tune the representations and treat this as a stepping stone in the representation learning paradigm. Data augmentation has been really successful in computer vision with image data sets. And this is because it's really easy to come up with these label preserving transformations to image data. When we rotate a bird, it's still a bird, horizontally flip it, translate it, zoom in, it's still a bird. But it's harder to design class preserving transformations for text data and natural language processing. For example, if we take the popular cropping augmentation in images from the actors is good and move it to just actors is, that doesn't make any sense. So kind of the limit of these obvious data augmentations for natural language processing is synonym replacement, where you say go to a dictionary and or a thesaurus and just replace good with great, amazing, awesome, things like that. And the next step might be to look in the nearest neighbors of something like a glove embedding vector space but still there are problems with this, great and terrible, would be nearby in a word vector space because they're used in similar contexts and things like this and this kind of limits and it's not so easy to just transform some uh, text and have you blow up the size of the data set while preserving the labels of the added samples. So the next step going from looking for nearest neighbors in some pre-trained word embedding space is to do contextual augmentation with these bi-directional encoder models. So the BERT model will look at the left and right context of a sentence, and we could put an intermediate mask in that sentence and then use it to produce new data. So we might have the food was good, and they can produce the food was great, and so on, but using more context rather than just this left or right of that food was, you could have context on the right side of this as well. But even with this, it's hard to, for this to definitely be class preserving. In this kind of simple example, it could you could have a Yelp sentiment review, the food was great, or it might say the food was terrible. So it's not obvious how to make this definitely class preserving. So here's a really great demo uh, linked in the description of the video if you want to play around with these mass language models and just getting a sense of how they'll fill out these mass tokens using the bi-directional context. So the next development in the story of contextual augmentation was conditional BERT. And conditional BERT is conditioned on the label of the sentence before it fills in the mass language modeling task. So in this case, the actor is good, and then good is gonna be masked out, but the conditional BERT model knows that the label is gonna be good. So the BERT model has these three embeddings, a token embedding where the tokens are mapped into the dense vector embedding space, a label embedding space as well, which is usually a segment embedding where you have uh, sentence A and then sentence B when you're using BERT for uh, the pre-training next sentence prediction task or say uh, question answering where you have A and B and they have the segment embedding, you replace that with a label embedding. So positive is embedded into a dense vector space 
that's added to these sequences of embeddings that then go into the BERT model. And therefore, it's gonna preserve the label of the output when it's doing this contextual augmentation. So the details behind how conditional BERT was introduced is that you have this labeled data set and you have the pre-trained BERT model that's been doing mass language modeling with this massive unlabeled text data set. So now you're gonna fine tune BERT by doing mass language modeling, but conditioning on the label of your labeled text classification data set. So then you're going to be able to sample new sentences and just append this to the data set as uh, augmented data by just sampling and then conditioning on the label of the text. So this idea of conditioning generative models by providing class label information works extremely well in GANs. And it's actually really hard to train GANs without doing this. So for example, if you're training a CIFAR 10 uh, model where you have these 10 classes like airplane, frog, dog, uh, whatever, you would give this class label information to the generator and the discriminator, and it makes this problem much more tractable. And then it's also used in conditional batch normalization where instead of, uh, in the case of our conditional BERT, we're using this, uh, it's a one-hot encoded embedding that then, or uh, one-hot encoded representation of the class label that's then mapped to this dense vector embedding table, and then that's just added to the uh, intermediate representation of the model, in this case, the original input, but sometimes you can imagine putting it in an intermediate feature of say a convolutional network or any of these neural network architectures. And one way of implementing conditioning would be with the uh, scale and shift parameters of batch normalization. So you'd have a uh, different normalization layer or different parameters of the normalization layer for each of the different classes. So there are different ways uh, to condition these models. And it's kind of this discussion of multitask learning also looks at these different ways of conditioning the model with different uh, tasks, like what's used in reinforced learning tell the agent that it's say uh, arranging the blocks in a certain order or putting the block in the cup or all these different tasks. So conditional BERT is a really interesting way to leverage these pre-trained transformer models to augment our existing small labeled data set in a class preserving way using this pre-trained model and through conditioning. But there are many different ways of doing the pre-training task, particularly the biggest way is whether you're doing an autoencoder framework, like how BERT has this denoising autoencoder objective with the mask in the middle of the input, or you can have the autoregressive uh, left to right where you use the context on the left to predict the mask token on the right, and then you slide the window over and keep on doing that for autoregressive uh, pre self-supervised pre-training. So and now in this paper, the subject of this video, we're looking at this paper comparing using BERT or GPT-2 or BART. And BART is also a autoencoder, but it has this sequence to sequence framework that kind of combines the best of BERT and GPT-2, and it is the more recent architecture design, and also just it works the best out of this in this study. So again, just to further communicate the differences between BERT, GPT-2, and BART, BERT is a denoising autoencoder, where you, or denoising autoencoder, where you start off with this input sequence, and you have the noise that's added in the form of masking, and then you reconstruct the original sequence in the denoising autoencoder way. An example in images would be if you had a cat image and then you added a like a noise map to it and then you reconstructed the original cat image. Autoregressive modeling is where you have this context and then you use it to predict this token at the end and then you would slide the window over and keep predicting in that kind of way. So it's seeing which of these architectures is better for using it to generate new data for our limited label data text classification setting. And then BART combines this uh, bidirectional autoencoder to encode, and then it decodes using an autoregressive decoder. So it has this sequence to sequence framework, this encoder decoder of encoding the sequence and then decoding a sequence. So the high level approach to how the researchers from Alexa AI are using data augmentation with pre-trained transformers is in this algorithm. So we have our training data set D sub train, which is say only 150 examples of questions that are labeled based on the topic of the question. Now we have our pre-trained model, and this could be uh, coming from the Hugging Face Transformers library where we're grabbing one of these pre-trained BERT models, a GPT-2 or BART. So now we're gonna fine tune the pre-trained model using our small label data set to obtain G-Tune. And this is gonna differ between whether we're fine tuning uh, GPT-2 or BERT or BART, and different ways of fine tuning each of these different uh, respective ways of setting up the self-supervised pre-training tasks. So now we have our artificial data set that's gonna come from the uh, generative models. So we're gonna have this hyperparameter S, which is how many examples we're gonna generate using our uh, generative model that's been fine-tuned for each example in our labeled data set. And we append that to the data set and we're just gonna train on this uh, new append uh, union of this 
original data and the synthetic data. So in our algorithm, we're taking these pre-trained generative transformer models and then fine tuning them on the limited label data set. So with BERT, we can just continue mass language modeling with the class label. And in this case, we're just gonna prepend the class label to the sequence to make a fair comparison between BERT, GPT, and BART, rather than doing this uh, embedding in the combination of the position segment and token embedding. So with GPT-2, the way that we're gonna fine tune this is by taking all of our label data and just smashing it together and making it this corpus of the class label and then the separator token and then the uh, text data, the sentence or whatever, and then the end of sentence token and then the next one and so on until we've done all of our label data. So each, each data point takes its point, label separator, uh, the data itself, and then end of sentence. So then when we're sampling from GPT-2, we're gonna sample it with a prompt. So we're gonna have the class label, a separator, and then some W1 decay, which is gonna be some prompt to uh, begin the generation with the GPT-2 uh, model. So then with BART, it's the same idea of just using the continuing the mass language modeling, but it has this different sequence to sequence encoder decoder architecture of uh, implementing that task. Another question explored in the paper is whether the class label should be added as a new entry to the vocabulary or not. So we have this vocabulary with these language models and we can treat this class label as a separate token in the vocabulary, or we can let the model treat the class label like another word in its vocabulary where it might even, if it's using something like subword tokenization, break apart the class label and then encode each of these tokens in the same kind of way as it's learning to encode all the other tokens in the data set. So in the study, they do find that uh, not including it to the vocabulary works better. But a key de uh, detail of this is that when you're fine tuning BERT, you're probably not using the same resources that were used to pre-train it. So it's gonna be hard to kind of integrate this new token into the embedding table and into the, all the pre-trained weights. So that's kind of their reasoning for why they think that the prepending without the adding to the vocabulary works better in these experiments. This distinction between adding the class label to the vocabulary or not has two interesting connections with recent language models, such as the T5 text-to-text -text transfer transformer and GPT-3, both of which do this text-to-text, -text, text input, and text output format. So in T5, the model is performing all of these different tasks with the same transformer model. It's a multitask uh, model. But the way they do this is by seeding it with translate English to German and then the sentence or the sequence or a cola sentence and then the sequence. But the key idea in the difference is that T5 has added these task definitions to the vocabulary. So it doesn't process sentence in the input like it would here. It treats sentence as if it says giraffe or cheetah or whatever. It doesn't really, it's just the encoding of the task. Compared to GPT-3, which it treats this input as if any other text, it has this, the same vocabulary for all the text, but it's not doing any fine tuning at all to learn the task that it's being prompted with. Back to this paper, comparing generative modeling for data augmentation, comparing BERT, GPT-2, and BART, they're experimenting on these three different data sets, the sentiment classification data set, SST, and then this to question topic classification, and then intent classification for a chatbot. So what they're gonna do is test the 1% of label setting, where you only have, say, 61 labeled points of each class, or 127 or 51. I think this might even be the total uh, label data in, in all of the classes as well. So these are the results of these three different data sets and using these three different models compared to a simpler data augmentation technique, the easy data augmentation paper, or not using data augmentation at all. So we see a really promising gain going from 59 to 63, 58 to 82, and then 30 to 37 in these different models with BART performing better than GPT-2 and BERT, and particularly GPT-2 not really performing so well at this task. So this is the this is why this is so exciting. We're seeing a huge gain in uh, using this data augmentation with pre-trained transformer models compared to no data augmentation or these simple kind of synonym replacement uh, NLP text data augmentations. So in this paper, they describe this technique of evaluation where you just train on this data and then see how it performs on the real data test set as the extrinsic evaluation. And a similar evaluation has been used in GANs with images in this paper, Classification Accuracy Score, where they're looking at how well does a model perform if it's only trained on image data that comes from generative models like BigGAN 
or the vector quantized variational autoencoder, and how does that compare with training on the real data? The authors also evaluate the generated text with this intrinsic analysis, and this is a common theme in evaluating generative models based on not only the quality of the data, such as looking at how realistic this dog or cheeseburger image is, but also the diversity. Does it produce all the different breeds of dogs or does it just produce this one dog image, which would have really high quality, but low diversity? So they propose these two ways of doing it. They check first for quality by uh, looking at the divergence in semantics between the meaning and then or with the original data and then the augmented data. Because remember, we're looping through the original small label data set and producing one augmented uh, example for every real example. So this is done with one of these sentence comparison semantic similarity tests. So they pooled representations at the CLS token of BERT and then compare those to the vector distance between the two. But other ways to do this, and I posted this on Twitter and got some really awesome answers about the best way to do uh, text similarity with these pre-trained models and sentence BERT and universal sentence encoders are two really great ways of also looking at the semantic difference between two different uh, text, uh, text pieces to see how much they differ semantically. So then the other way they do this is they test the diversity of the generated models by looking at the ratio of the n-grams with the generated and the real text. And this is a pretty convenient uh, domain analysis technique for text data. They use a similar idea in Don't Stop Pre-Training where they're comparing, uh, going from the corpus that's used to pre-train Roberta and then these like Amazon reviews or biomedical papers and seeing the overlap in text to measure domain similarity. You really don't have such a nice thing to do with say image data. So these are really exciting results for using these pre-trained transformer models to augment our limited label data sets. But we might still expect further in-domain language model fine tuning to improve this. In this paper, Don't Stop Pre-Training, they're doing this task of just taking the generative uh, language model and then fine tuning it on the next domain, then the next domain, and then the label data task. So in this case, you're treating this self-supervised pre-training task as a stepping stone in the representation learning journey. It's the first step you do with this massive unlabeled data set and you have this task and then you start uh, climbing the ladder with the new task and then the uh, further self-supervised learning with different domains. But what this paper is kind of showing with this way is that we could probably get more out of this uh, self-supervised learning model and it's learned a useful task that we can use particularly for our limited label data settings. So further, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this. We explored the BERT versus GPT versus BART with BART performing the best for this task, but a lot of innovation is happening in pre-training these language models. And we have other objectives in addition to denoising autoencoders and autoregressive models, such as Marge, the pre-training via paraphrasing paper, uh, Pegasus and Electra, and all of these papers have shown gains and they're also particularly better suited for the downstream task that representation is then going to be fine-tuned in the previous example of this representation learning uh, stepping stones. So this is just an illustration of what Marge is, the pre-training view of paraphrasing, where instead of just uh, putting mass in this target document, you're going to have a retriever model that finds these, uh, the context is going to be used to condition on reconstructing this input. So it's not really like a, a autoencoder where you have the original X and then it's put into X prime and then reconstruct X rather using X to get this evidence Z and then use that to reconstruct X. So just showing that there are different ways of setting up this pre-training task and it could lead to more interesting ways of generating new data for data augmentation. This would have a lot of variance. You'd expect a lot of diversity in what would come out of uh, sampling from this. This exploration of data augmentation using pre-trained transformer models is similar to another exciting paper, Pattern Exploiting Training. Pattern Exploiting Training uses the pre-trained transformer models to label the unlabeled data in the semi-supervised learning setting. So in this setting, we have, say, a massive amount of tweets, but we've only taken the time to manually label a small amount of them. So we use the language model and these templates to get the language model to label the unlabeled data, and we'll fine tune on that newly labeled data. So it's a different way of looking at how we can use these pre-trained transformer models, not just as the first step in representation learning, but to actually use them in labeling this data and in expanding our data sets for data augmentation. Thanks for watching this overview of data augmentation using pre-trained transformers. I think this is a really exciting study and area of research into how we can leverage these pre-trained transformer models or any kind of pre-trained generative model, whether it's in images or text, to augment the data sets for downstream tasks. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. Mm -hmm.